Welcome to another episode of The Bible Says This. What say you? Psalms 33 and verse 4, the A clause says, For the word of the Lord is right. I am Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr., your friendly neighborhood truth teller. And I'm glad to be talking to you today from the word of the Lord. I want to read a passage of scripture to you, and I want you to listen to me. And if you're where you can, get your Bibles. I'm coming from Jeremiah chapter 23, and uh, verse 1 says, I'm going to read 1 and 2 in your hearing, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to read it as it is written. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. It has an exclamation point there showing that Jeremiah was preaching hard. He must have been Kojic. I mean, he was preaching hard saying this. And he says, saith the Lord, therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, thus saith Jehovah Elohim of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. You didn't go to check on them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And then Jeremiah even speaks of the, the, the situation he was going through. For there were many, many, many false prophets preaching at the time uh, of his ministry. He says, my heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. Listen to this. I am like a drunken man and like a man whom wine have overcome because of the word of the Lord, because of the words of his holiness. Jeremiah was preaching God's truth and the prophets, prophets were prophesying against him. And he says this. For the land is full of, of, of adulterers, that is idolatry. People were mixing false religions with the religion of, uh, of Yahweh, with the religion of Judaism. They were serving false gods. He called it adultery. For because of swearing, that is cursing, the land mourneth. You want to know where global warming comes from? If there is such a thing, the land mourneth. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up and their course is evil, and their force is not right. Their course is evil, that is, their course is violent, violence, and their force is not right. For both prophet and priest are profane, that is, they are worldly, yea, in my house I have found their wickedness, saith the Lord. I found altars to false gods. I found untruths. I found false religions, the Lord says, even in my house because of these false prophets. My friends, I'm going to tell you something. I want to tell you something. The word of the Lord is true and it stands alone. Now, I want to talk to you and I want you to listen. And uh, do not turn me off for the next 11 minutes or so. I, I want to share something with you. And it may be a little hard to hear, but it's true nonetheless. As you know by now, if you followed me, uh, I, I speak to things. I'm not, I'm not a political person, but I don't know how you can be a preacher and not speak to the things that are going on in this world. There are preachers who say, well, it's just politics. But let me tell you something, my friends. Public policy affects private behavior. The things that are today's tolerances will be the next generation's laws. And when laws are passed and bills are written and things are put into law, they affect the way we live. So uh, I want to talk to you about something that took place. It was public. It's on television. Everybody saw it. And I want to say before I even comment on this, I have absolutely no personal knowledge. I have no nothing negative to say about this speaker in terms of the way they conduct themselves, the way they live their lives. As far as I know, the speaker's a stand up guy. As far as I know, uh, he's a married man, a family man. And when I see him in public, I shake his hand and show him much respect because I have much respect. 
respect for him. As a matter of fact, I admire him. I admire his wit, his intelligence, and in terms of delivery, in terms of what this man has to say, nobody says it better. But I'm here to tell you that there is a difference between style and substance. And sometimes when you go beyond what, and you study what is said, you go beyond what you have initially heard and you just get down and unpack the suitcase, you find out that a lot of things that you heard was not so. Now, at the Democrat Party convention, the DNC convention packed out, oh my, they featured uh, a fellow North Carolinian, uh, the Dr. Reverend William Barber, he is the president of the NAACP for the state of North Carolina. Uh, we refer to, I refer to him as my good friend, Dr. Barber, and he saw my, my son-in-law and my daughter on the plane not too long ago, and he was so gracious, and they enjoyed being in his presence. He let, they let him know who they, who they are, and he said, oh yes, my good friend, uh, 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 Bishop Wooden said, now we disagree, we fight, but we're good friends. And I really appreciate uh, Dr. Barber for that, and I feel the same way about him. But we do have profound differences. And, uh, and the differences that we, we have are not differences that are personal. There's nothing that I know personally evil or, or uh, 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 untoward about this man. But on issues of public policy and things that are in public, and the key is public, we have disagreements. Now he gave his speech, and uh, and it was a it was a it was a speech. And I've heard preachers say you got to give Reverend Barber credit. He killed him, man. He he said it. Well, I'm here to tell you, in terms of knowing how to use the voice, in terms of liberty and style of delivery. Let me tell you, uh, I don't know if the Apostle Paul could deliver a sermon like the Reverend uh, Barber can. But in terms of substance. I have a problem with some of the things that the good doctor uh, had to say. Now, and I want to look at them. He says this in his speech. He said in his speech, and I have the transcript from the speech, so I'm going to read it. He said, uh, good evening, my brothers and sisters. I come before you tonight as a preacher, the son of a preacher, a preacher immersed in the movement at five years old, I don't come tonight representing any organization, but I come to talk about faith and morality. And the word faith here, he's using it, faith as in doctrine and morality, okay? I'm a preacher, he says again. Uh, I'm a theologically conservative, liberal, evangelical, biblicist. He says, I know it may sound strange, but I'm a conservative because uh, I work to conserve a divine tradition that teaches us to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before our God. Right off the bat, the mighty preacher, he quotes from the book of Micah, Micah chapter 6 and verse uh, 8. He says, he have shown thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, that is to do justice, uh, religious and social justice, justice, and to love mercy, to be kind and, 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 and loving, uh, to love mercy and to walk humbly before thy God. The Reverend Barber is as correct as can be, but what he leaves out is that Micah, the preacher here, he prophesied during the days of the prophet Isaiah. And one of the problems that was going on in the world when Isaiah was prophet is that Judah had, been, had, had, been, had given itself over to idolatry. Judah was recognizing Judah. The southern kingdom was being as loyal to false gods as it had been to the God that brought them out. Judah, uh, Isaiah asked Judah a, a question. How did the faithful city become a harlot? Judah was given to idolatry and wickedness. Judah was unfaithful 
to the Lord. So if you take Micah's comments and Micah preached during, he was a contemporary of Isaiah. Isaiah's ministry lasted longer than his. Isaiah was part of a royal, he was a blue blood, a royal family line. Family line. Uh, uh, Micah was from uh, the tribe of Gath, a little known people, uh, but Micah preached nonetheless and Micah was a man of God. But if you take Micah's words and set them into their context, uh, Michael contextually uh, preached from a much different angle than the Reverend Barber. As a matter of fact, their angle contextually was polar opposites because Barber in his speech is not calling us to adhere to the teachings of the Bible in their context. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read some of his quotes and then read the scripture. and You'll find out that what Barber, what Barber said, the scripture said, the scripture just simply doesn't say. So if we're going to quote Micah, we need to quote Micah in the context of Micah. And yes, uh, uh, the people were offering offerings. Yes, the people were giving sacrifices and all that kind of stuff. They were going through their, their religious uh, rituals, but the rituals were not changing their uh, uh, their, their habits and the way they live. The rituals was not cleaning them up moral, morally nor spiritually. Their, their, their religion had no effect on them. That is what was going on in Michael's day. And when Michael said that we should do justly, he, wasn't, he was not talking about the government giving someone a job. He was talking about justly in the sight of the Lord. He, was, he said that we're to love mercy. We are to be merciful and kind, but we're also to walk humbly before our God. And how do you walk humbly before the Lord? You obey his word. You obey his moral code. You do what the Lord says do. So let's go on here. He says, he quotes Michael. He says, I've had the privilege of traveling the country with uh, Reverend Dr. James Forbes and Reverend Dr. Tracy Blackman and Sister Simeon Campbell as we are working together in the revival and calling for a revolution of values. Now, he's calling for a revival. Now, this is a man who marches for LGBTQ rights. This is a man who has marched for a woman's right choose, I'm going to finish the sentence, to choose whether or not to kill the unborn baby in her womb. Is this part of the revival of, uh, rev uh, of values that he's talking about? He says, as we travel the country, we see things. That is why I am so concerned about those who say so much about what God says so little uh, and say so little about what God says so much. My question to the good reverend is, how many times does the Lord have to say a thing for it to be true? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14 and 6, one time. That's recorded one time in scripture. David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's recorded one time in scripture. Psalms 23, 1. Uh, uh, the, the, Jesus says, I am the, rever, uh, the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he was dead, yet shall he live. John 11 and 25 recorded, uh, is recorded one time in scripture. Jesus said, John 14 and 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. One time in scripture. He also went on to say, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 14 and 27, one time in scripture. Jesus says, no man, no, no greater, greater love has no man than this, that a man will lay down his life for his friend. John 15 and 13, recorded one time in scripture. Galatians 5 and 7, you did run well. Who did hinder you? Recorded one time in scripture. Uh, but the fruit of the spirit, Galatians 5, 22, and he gives a list of the fruit of the spirit. Rec recorded one time in scripture. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Recorded one time in scripture, Genesis 1 and 1. Uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, John 1 and 1. Recorded one time in scripture. And the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, John uh, of 1 and 14. One time in scripture. There's so many scriptures. There's so many truths that's recorded one time in scripture, Reverend, that uh, my question to you is, how many times does a passage of scripture has to be listed for it to be true? Uh, most of the scriptures that we quote when it comes to giving, <laughs> raising money. Uh, 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 listen, Malachi said one time in Malachi 3 and 10, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. I bet you every preacher knows that. And it was recorded one time in scripture. 
Now I'm running out of time. I'm running out of time. Listen, I'm, uh, look, you got to join me for part two of this because I am going to talk about these things because the Bible, my friends, is right. Am I, are you with me? Look, the Bible says this. What say you?